Um, thank you for attending the, the forum. Sure. And my name is Rory Cox. I am an analyst at the Public Utilities Commission. And um, before we get into the panelists, um, I just wanted to sort of run through um, just a, a, a few very high level slides about what the state is concerned with and what we're doing at the at the PUC. Um, if you, does anybody, first of all, who is new to the water energy nexus? Anybody, one person? Okay, um, good to know. Um, has anybody seen these two photos side by side before? So I see a hand and a nod, a couple other hands. So what those, the, the, these photos are the, um, the snowpack taken on a day in January 2013 and the snowpack taken on the same day in January 2014. And um, that, is the, that, that is what we're faced with. Our, our snowpack, you probably all know, is very important to us. It's sort of like our own natural reservoir that, uh, that, that brings us water year round. And it's in kind of dire straits right now, um, this year. And it's something that um, the, the state is very concerned with. Um, this is just a list of the panelists, which um, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce on a individual basis when we get there. Um, but just sort of how, how bad is it? And this is sort of some of the, some of the um, indicators of how bad it is. The snowpack is 18% of normal. Um, some reservoirs are as, as low as 30% of capacity. There have been 46 local emergency proclamations. 20 of them are countywide, so from counties. Um, wildfires have burned over 15,000 acres this year. Um, that's actually old information from two weeks ago. Um, it's been more since then, um, since I put that slide together. And um, up to one million acres of ag land will be affected and food prices will increase as a result of our current um, drought. So the um, message that the, that the uh, Water Board really wanted me to convey to everybody is that um, there are resources for local governments. They really do want everybody to um, step up and be on board with saving as much water as we can. And um, there there's, was emergency drought legislation which provides um, $687 million to support drought relief for housing and food for impacted workers, bond funds to help local communities capture and manage water, bond funds to help secure emergency drinking water supplies in drought impacted communities. Um, for more information, there is a website um, where all these re resources live. And uh, it is uh, www.ca.gov slash drought. And um, the folks from the Water Board and the Department of Water Resources wanted me to urge you all to uh, look at those resources and see if any of them will work in your communities um, because um, we are in a, a dire situation. Um, I, just want, and, and I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about what the PUC is doing on this topic. Um, we do have a, we um, launched recently the Energy Upgrade California umbrella brand for all kind of demand side conservation activities and included in that umbrella is um, water savings. So um, next week I was hoping to show um, a TV commercial that's all about saving water, um, which involves a, a grizzly bear growling at his neighbor for watering his driveway, but um, they don't have the um, they don't have the AV right AV equipment to show that that commercial. But that's sort of the the, the motif is a riff on the California state flag. He, it's a it's a California grizzly is what's on what's on the flag, or so I'm told. They used to. <laughs> um, so that's that, I'm told that's that's the story of the bear on the flag. Um, and I'm just going to show a couple of, uh, I've, I have more slides that are in this deck, which you can look at on your own. I'm not going to go through them all, be, um, but I just want to sort of give the high level de definition of what is, in, what is embedded energy. And um, the PUC, we define it as the amount of energy in kilowatt hours or in therms needed to supply, convey, and treat water um, delivered to a user and to collect and transport used water for treatment prior to safe discharge. So um, there are two distinctly different types of water impacts on the energy sector. And this is sort of the what the water energy nexus is all about. Energy use by the water sector, so that is the amount, timing, and location of energy needed to support water sector operations. And there's energy use by water customers or the amount of energy used by 
water customers during the consumption of water, whether for pumping, heating, or other purposes. Um, the energy IOUs are currently piloting projects to reduce embedded energy in water. Um, items like um, incentivizing um, more efficient pumps in agricultural uses and industrial uses, um, down to um, giving away free shower heads when they go into people's homes and, and, um, and do energy upgrades. So there's a whole um, raft of pilots that we're doing with the, with the IOUs. Um, but one thing that we haven't done, and I'm just going to go by some of these real quickly just to save time. You can look at these later. But <clears throat> the, the, we kind of have a, you know, we have some big questions before us at the PUC. And, um, and you know, they are, you know, what is, you know, what, what should electric, electric ratepayers be paying for to incentivize water savings is sort of the big dilemma that we're grappling with. Um, you know, what is the potential for saving water, for saving energy through the water sector in California? And when water efficiency programs save energy, how do we account for those savings? So what is the value to energy and water repairs? And what is the value to California from a societal perspective? And, you know, the PUC, we are, you know, guardians of ratepayer dollars. And, you know, we, it's our, it's our job to make sure the right dollar goes to the the right place. So um, what we're working on right now is um, a water energy cost effectiveness calculator. Um, and uh, we have a, a Navigant Consulting is working on the, that with us. And um, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Um, I believe we may have a, yeah, don't, you know, don't quote me on this, but we may have a, a some sort of a draft version of that this fall. Um, but it's um, it's it's in a it's in this uh, uh, cost effectiveness proceeding that we're undergoing, and it's um, but you know until then we have we have the pilots, but we don't have the you know we're still working on a more definitive you know how do we account for um, water energy water energy as it pertains to water savings as it pertains to energy. So those those are just my very brief comments and. Um, my contact information. Now I'm going to switch into moderator mode and very quickly get out of mine and introduce the next speaker. Uh, Lori Swanson is the water resources specialist for um, San Diego County, County Water Authority, the regional water, water wholesaler. Um, Lori manages water use efficiency programs and is a San Diego na native. And uh, she received her bachelor's degree in civil engineering from San Diego State University. So um, welcome, Lori. Thank you. Um, so this is our headquarters, San Diego County Water Authority. Um, we are the regional water wholesaler. So we don't deal directly with the public, but we do have our own infrastructure. So we design, construct, operate, and maintain <clears throat> pipelines, pump stations, flow control facilities, we own and operate um, a reservoir, a water treatment plant, a hydroelectric facility, uh, and we're also going to have a desal project come online um, at the end of 2015. So this is our service area map. Um, so this is a map of our 24 uh, member agencies. Um, our takeoff point is in Riverside at Lake Skinner. Um, so we service the entire San Diego County. Next, please. Uh, just a few facts. Um, again, our, our retail member agencies that sell to the public. Uh, we are governed by a 34 um, member board of directors. What's interesting about um, the Water Authority and other wholesale water agencies is that those 24 member agencies make up our 35 member board of directors. So our customers are actually deciding um, what our capital improvement projects are going to be, what that budget is going to look like. Um, they decide our policies and our procedures, um, who we do business with, and how we do business. Um, again, we serve the entire population of um, San Diego County. Next. So we are literally at the end of the pipeline for the state of California. Um, we're it. So our water comes from hundreds of miles away. Um, it comes from the Bay Delta. Uh, most of you here are familiar with that. And the Colorado River is the other supply source. 
those two sources are mixed at Metropolitan Water District, um, Southern, Cali Southern California's um, largest uh, whole wholesale water. And they're blended there and then sent to San Diego County. Um, so you can see at the bottom that green area there, that's San Diego County, and that's the Water Authority's um, service area as well. Uh, what's nice about doing um, projects with SDG&E, we're very fortunate that our ter two service areas almost align perfectly. So we're not having to leave anybody out. Um, if, if we're talking about uh, regional projects, um, then all of our member agencies are going to be able to participate in them. Next slide. Um, again, the State Water um, Project, um, series of reservoirs, um, and pumping stations and uh, canals um, from Northern California uh, down to Metropolitan Water District. Next, and I think everybody's familiar with the Colorado River. So besides these two water supply sources, the Water Authority um, also has a quantification settlement agreement. It has uh, a couple of components. One of those is we pay for water conservation out at Imperial Irrigation District. So we pay farmers to conserve water. And that water that they conserve comes to um, San Diego County for um, use here as a, um, a, a way for us to meet our demands. Um, another piece of that uh, settle quantification settlement is there are the Coachella and our All-American canals. They're earthen line canals, and what we had a project that actually lined those canals with concrete, so the water that stopped seeping through um, is saved and sent here, and we use that water here to help meet demands as well. Um, we do water transfers with other water agencies. Um, you know, sometimes we just buy it right out, sometimes they store it and we use it when we need it. Um, so for many years, uh, the Water Authority has been working to diversify its water supply portfolio. And so including in that is a look ahead to um, increasing local supply. It's all about being less dependent on imported water. So in years past, we've um, had 70% of our water supply come from somewhere else and we continue to work to have that number um, decrease. Um, and then one of the most biggest pieces, of course, is gonna be our desal plant that's uh, coming on next year that will supply about 7% of our water supply, and it is our only drought-proof uh, supply. So a little bit about our SDG&E partnership. We've had probably about a 20-year or so partnership with SDG&E. We have a lot of projects um, under our belt, um, anywhere from helping the Water Authority and its member agencies become more energy efficient, um, and then also um, some state-of-the-art um, projects that I want to talk about today that help save um, water, and then, of course, um, the energy savings that's embedded in the water savings. So this is our leak loss detection program. So I knew this was gonna be an afternoon session, so I just wanted to see if people were gonna pay attention to my presentation. So this isn't actually in our service area. Um, so just to clarify that, um, we do have a leak loss detection program, not just for the Water Authority and our infrastructure, but we partnered with SDG&E to help um, our member agencies um, with their own leak loss detection. And so there's the potential for a large amount of water savings because we're talking about a big infrastructure. So if you think of your house or your business and all the um, pipes and connections and meters that go with that, if you can think about a whole city and what's involved with their infrastructure, that's the scale that we're looking at. So we're looking at the, the big picture for uh, a retail water agency. And I know Scott's gonna um, talk in detail about his um, leak loss detection, um, so I'm just touching lightly on ours. Um, and I was also asked to talk about some of the lessons learned. So when we first got funding, we had $210,000 to spend on just the leak loss detection. But for a big city with a big infrastructure, it's not a lot of money, but it's enough to look at a good portion of their infrastructure. And so we sent um, you know, this great news out to all 24 member agencies, and I was strategizing on how we were going to not play favorites and you know, pick the right agency was the right fit for the program, and nobody wanted to sign up. 
And so <laughs> I was like, what? So we went to plan B and working with um, our own consultants on board to help us, the specialists, uh, we kind of bubbled up what agencies we thought would be the best fit and then we approached those agencies individually. So we did get um, a large agency to sign up to look at part of their infrastructure. And so that program um, is going on right now and we really expect to get quite a bit of water savings out of um, not only their leak loss um, program, but also some um, pressure management. Next one, please. Um, the other one that's kind of unique to water agencies is we have a water smart landscape efficiency program. So this one is for the commercial sector. It's very prescriptive on um, what sites we sign up for the program. So the sites have to be four acres or more, and the incentives are paid out um, we worked with the um, CLCA, the California Landscape Contractors Association, and so we actually um, pay them to get a site that meets all the criteria. It, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy task. So they got an incentive to get a, a site um, lined up. There's 20 of them in the program right now. Um, they get paid up to $5,000. The hardware um, upgrades include um, irrigation upgrades uh, to be more efficient at the site. Um, they get paid to put the site on a water budget and then follow what that water budget is. So their data is uploaded and the water authority's program manager can monitor the site from his own office at the water authority. Um, and so the performance incentives include a year later to see if they're meeting um, their water savings and it's expected that they're gonna save about 20% of the water on the site. So since these are four acre sites, um, we're anticipating a good amount of water savings from this program. Next, please. Detention facility retrofit. So this one, um, you guys might have heard, um, we've, we've done it in the past and other water agencies have um, teamed and done it in the past also. So uh, electronic flush valves are installed at the, at the jail. This is based on a previous um, program that we did at another facility in San Diego County that had great success. So we teamed up again with SDG&E to do it um, at a different county uh, location. So this actually incorporated the county of San Diego as well. They own and operate the facilities. And so um, you know they, they have a lot of time invested too in helping with this project. So um, apparently there's quite a bit of uh, recreational flushing going on at the facilities. <laughs> And so anywhere from um, using signals to each other to stuffing something down the toilet so it overflows so they get out of their cell for a little while while maintenance. So what this does is it um, actually brings um, the control for the flushing to the facility. And so, um, you know, it can be set in a number of ways, but they can, you know, if they flush more than two times in five minutes, they get locked out for a certain amount of time. And so um, this has a significant amount of water savings with just the installation of the electronic flush valves themselves. Um, and then of course, shower heads and, and aerators. A little bit on what the drought means to San Diego County. Next slide. The governor proclaimed uh, a drought emergency in February. And if you've been in California long enough, next slide, this isn't the first time we've seen Governor Brown up there doing the same thing. So this is from 1977. Next slide. And Rory already showed you one of these slides. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. Here in San Diego County, we don't really drive by and see this. So this is Lake Oroville. Um, it's w one of our water supply sources here in San Diego. Next slide. And this is, I think, worth repeating that, um, you know, if you live up there, you're seeing that. But if you're living down here, you're not really getting the picture that we're um, not in very good shape. Um, this is my last slide, but in um, order to really give you a better picture of what the Water Authority is doing to help address the drought, <clears throat> we developed a microsite um, just to provide um, not only our member agencies, but um, the customers out there at large so they can get updates whenever they want. So this is the Water Authority's microsite. 
And so if you were to go to any of our websites, we have a conservation site and we have a regular water authority site, a pop-up comes and it asks you, do you want to learn more about the drought? And if you say yes, it'll take you to this website. And so the first thing we do is we thank people for the good job that they've already done. So we're actually using 27% less water now than we did in 2007. So we tell people thank you, but in line with what the governor is asking, we're asking people to save even more water. Everything right now is still voluntary, um, but this gives you um, tools and tips and where to go for incentives to help your resident or, or your business save even more water. So this is, uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you. Scott Miller started working for the uh, City of Westminster Water Division in 1990. Starting at the bottom, he worked his way up to Water Superintendent in 2004. He manages a staff of 20 associates, maintains 21,000 service connections, and operates on an annual budget of $14 million. So without any further ado, um, Scott Miller. As advertised, I'm Scott Miller. Uh, I was asked to come speak. Um, on the water leak detection program that we have going uh, that SE has put together um, and we volunteered to be a part of this and so they asked me to kind of recap it for this uh, uh, for this conference and um, to throw some ideas out there um, <clears throat> out of curiosity do we have any water producers suppliers here okay um, no, that's fine. I just I just wanted to address them if they were here. Um, you know, one of the hard challenges that we have is, um, you know, like any other utility or any other business, um, everybody believes that they're doing things the absolute right way, um, but that's not always the case. And and um, you know, the whole idea here is to to start thinking outside the box. So much has changed in California, and. <clears throat> It's, it's not just this drought, it's the fact that we, uh, you know, uh, demand continues to go up, but supply stays the same. So, you know, there, there's challenges that we're faced with, and with every drought, it gets more and more severe, uh, simply because the demand is there. Um, the drought may be uh, the worst, uh, you, you know, that, that's ever been recorded, but every every time we have a dry year, the impact gets greater and greater because that demand continues to grow, but the supply is not there. <clears throat> so in Westminster, what are we doing and why? Um, <clears throat> energy efficiency for us is, is a huge component of what we do. Um, it's the third uh, largest um, budget item that I have. Uh, when, <clears throat> when I started looking at this and, and trying to turn the corner um, on how much energy we're using and what it's costing us, um, we were just under $600,000 a year in electrical costs and um, now we're at about 380. So I think we've taken it the right way. Um, <clears throat> and it's just with the advancements of technology um, and the things that we can do and the way we can look at it. Um, we've come up with some really creative ideas and, um, and partnering, partnering with uh, Southern California Edison, we've, we've really made some of this stuff happen. Um, one of the biggest things that we have is um, pump efficiencies. Um, Southern California Edison will come out and do an efficiency test on every one of my pumps every two years. Um, and then what we do is, is on that off year, we hire a contractor to do the same thing. So we're running efficiencies twice a year, um, every year. And what that tells us is, is how healthy is that well. And it also gives me an idea of when I need to rehab that well and improve the efficiency. Because um, when the efficiency starts to drop, it goes rather quick. So it's something you have to look at, at, at on a pretty regular basis. Um, <clears throat> The, one of the nice things about knowing, um, because every well acts different, knowing which ones are most efficient with today's technology tied to SCADA, um, when energy is most uh, expensive for us, we run our most efficient wells. Um, it, it took a while to get that to happen, but we've got it now where it's tied into SCADA where we'll select the wells 
that need to run, and as demand goes up, it starts from the most efficient to the least efficient. And, and, and we've seen some huge savings from that. Um, you know, you don't want to uh, run a, a uh, less efficient pump during the most expensive time if you have one sitting over here that will. So it's been, it's been a huge asset to us um, to, to do these efficiency tests and to, to log all that data and plug it into SCADA um, so that we can uh, be as efficient as we can, especially during the critical times of day. Um, it also helps Edison, uh, you know, because uh, ironically, you know, when their demand's the highest, my demand's the highest. You know, they, they, they drive together. Um, <clears throat> The other thing efficiencies do is they, uh, you know, they're, they're great indicators as to where that well's at, um, what's the health of that well, and, and when do I need to take action. So what we were able to do is um, with each efficiency test, they'll, they'll give us uh, uh, the numbers, and we've, we've designed a program where when we, when we hit a certain efficiency um, or lack thereof, uh, what we do is um, we've developed a program where uh, when it hits that uh, performance level, um, the cost to repair it is recovered within three years just on the savings by reconditioning that well. And then everything after that is basically, you know, money back in our pocket. So it's been a great tool for us. Um, you know, just as an example, if, if a well is, is running at 45% at, at uh, efficiency, um, I can re rehabilitate that well and that cost, the savings every year after, for in three years I can pay for that rehab. So it's been uh, a great tool for us and, and a great way to keep things moving forward. Um, also another big piece of that because, wow, that was really fast. I'm going to go a lot faster now. Um, uh, also, the other thing that happens is, is they do a calibration of your meters, which um, when you're paying for water, uh, just like anybody else, you want to make sure that that meter's um, reading correctly. Next slide. Um, water leak detection program. Um, SCE approach, approached us uh, with this pilot program where they wanted to go out and they wanted to do a complete survey of the city and, and use uh, uh, listening devices, looking for leaks, um, and and uh, I absolutely thought it was a great program. Uh, you don't always see a leak; um, they don't always surface, depending on what kind of material it's in. It could leak for for quite a long time, and and you won't know it. But there's a couple of uh, uh, indicators that help us look. But this program itself um, is actually taking a, a solid look at that. Um, the other, the other thing it do, they, that this program is doing is, is it's basically a really intense audit. You know, um, what are we putting in the ground and what's being sold and, and what's the differential and what does that cost? So um, it's just another way for us to look at, at ways to be more efficient and, and uh, 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 more accurate. Um, also, um, the non rev Non-revenue water loss or unaccounted for water, um, that's a huge number to us. Um, it has a lot of, uh, it has a lot of uh, indicators in it as to how healthy is my system. The other thing that we look at is pressure management. If you have a lot of pressure fluctuations, then you have the potential for more breaks. So it's something that we really try to look at. Um, Again, meter uh, efficiencies and, and deficiencies. Um, having those meters calibrated on a regular basis is really good. Next slide. Um, to me, this is big. A lot of people don't really spend a lot of time understanding what their unaccounted for water is or non-revenue water is. And that's leaks, that's hydrant flushing, that's anything that you can't quantify, but I'm paying for the water coming out of the ground or coming from the import connection. Um, California Urban Water Conservation Council has said that 10% unaccounted for or non-revenue water is the acceptable level. Um, but at 10% for a medium-sized system such as mine, you can see what the cost is. You're almost at a million dollars that it cost me um, at 10%. Um, what we found is, is once you hit about 8%, uh, 
you need to start taking or we start taking action on tightening the system and finding this water making sure everything's being registered because again that will pay for itself any measures that we take um, next slide that was really fast 12 minutes um, biggest challenge is, is um, letting other people in um, when these people come in to to start looking at our system um, it, it really uh, you know it puts everybody on edge you don't like outsiders inside your 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 business um, but you got to have an open mind it's thinking outside the box it, it's it's trying to do the best that we can not only are we saving water but we're also saving energy and at the same time it's it's dollars back in the pocket um, some of the challenges and solutions um, this project the amount of data that they needed from us was astronomical and um, what I'm hearing is is everybody that they bring to the table that's the first thing they say is we just don't have time um, for us our approach was incorporate a lot of guys into the program and bring it into little bite-sized pieces and before you know it it all came together so it is doable next slide um, the the whole the whole energy and water for us that's always been a huge disconnect um, in Orange County I'll say but but with the city of Westminster as well it's one of those things where um, you know we feel like they don't understand us and we don't understand them but um, you know this is a step in the right direction working together as a team to come up with answers on how to save water energy and money which is what everybody wants next slide um, for us, um, my biggest thing is, is all this work, if you don't do something with it, it was really uh, just a waste of time, and, and, and I don't like to waste time. So um, for us, uh, we've identified a, a few things that we can work on. We're really excited to move forward with it, and, and we think we're going to see some real savings from it. So uh, it's been a real positive thing. And I made it. Thank you very much. Um, so Misty Mersich, is that how you say it? Uh, is the Climate Protection Program Analyst for the Sonoma County Regional Climate Protection Authority. Currently the Project Manager for Climate Action 2020, a multi-jurisdictional climate action implementation plan. And uh, she also manages the implementation of energy efficiency programs. She holds a Master's in Urban and Regional Planning. And shall I go ahead and uh, introduce your co-presenter, uh, Chris Bratt, is a senior program consultant with the local government group of BKI. Chris works, works with energy and water efficiency programs for Sonoma County, Association, Association of Bay Area Governments, and LA County. Take it away. So, um, as Roy mentioned, I'm with the Sonoma County Regional Climate Protection Authority. And that is an entity that was legislatively created in 2009. Um, and their main mission is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they were created by all nine cities in Sonoma County and the county of Sonoma. And so I uh, report to a bo elected board of uh, members from all the cities and then three county supervisors. Um, and if you're interested more about that organization, um, I'll be happy to talk to you about that after. Um, next slide. Next slide, Kristen Misty. <laughs> Uh, today, we're going to talk to you about our Pay As You Save program, one of our consumer-based water and energy programs that we have a pilot in the town of Windsor and also in the city of Hayward, and then also touch a little bit about some of the other pilots we have. Next slide. So Pay As You Save is customers that are paying for energy and water efficiency measures over time as a surcharge on their water bill. Um, we found that customers get immediate savings, and this is um, energy and water efficiency measures with no upfront cost and no new debt. Next slide. Um, so we call this an offer that works. So pay as you save is an offer that works. And the way it works is customers are, um, we're able to calculate based on customers' usage um, reported usage of what they, how much water they use and how much energy they use in their house. 
and then they can determine um, which measures they'd like to install. So a lot of that um, could be toilets or aerators or um, we also have some landscaping measures. Um, and the idea is that they would have immediate net savings. So for every, every 75 cent surcharge, they save about a dollar. So that's what that shows there. And I'm going to turn this one over to Chris. We're kind of doing tag team here. Yeah, thanks, Misty. Um, so the idea of this offer that works is really how do you kind of grab a customer, an end user, and help them kind of wake up to what's possible. And this offer that works is delivered by some pretty tight coordination between typical program implementers. Uh, we micromanage things a little bit, if you will, to, to really try to deliver our high customer uptake. Um, and so if we want to start with thinking about a typical utility program and how that works with program operation or maybe a third party program operator. Um, the utility really crafts the program based upon what works for their, their customers, what is commonly, you know, the built environment within their service territory and develops a package of measures and develops a kind of a list of certified contractors. And the idea is for those certified contractors really to be armed with the offer, the ability to go to a customer and install measures that they can tell the customer you're going to save on your bill starting tomorrow. Um, that might be water, that might be looking at electricity or natural gas savings, but as customers, as utility payers, we're often looked at, looking at that you know monthly bill, the money that goes out the door every month. And so if a contractor can install measures that is saving people money on their bill, then that's something that is, we found is really appealing to people. It makes sense. Um, and so the mechanism is really this cycle where the utility facilitates this relationship, to, gets upfront cash to pay for contractors when they install measures from either internal funds or a third party capital provider. The contractor installs these items for the customer and make the customer repays for that measure over time through a charge attached to their meter. Uh, and so not only is there the protection of immediate net savings, but there's also additional protections with it being attached to the meter where one, they're repaying over time rather than all up front, up front. Two, if for some reason they move the items, I mean, you're not gonna take your toilet with you, right, most likely. Um, so the toilet's gonna stay in the house the person who moves into that house is going to take over the payment on the surcharge on the meter, but they're also going to enjoy the savings from that toilet that's still in the house. Uh, and also, if for some reason in the payment period, if the measure fails for whatever reason, because there's this tight relationship between all the program implementers, certain things like extended warranties on parts and labor, extended product warranties have been negotiated up front to make sure that if a measure fails during the payment period, it can be replaced at no upfront costs or no additional costs to the customer. So this is a way in which rather than using rebates, we've found it to kind of really work well to look at cost effective items and find a, a, a good way for customers to pay for them, but also benefit from them over time. Next slide. So our first pilot project that we did was in the town of Windsor. Next slide. Um, the RCPA sh shopped this idea out to the different cities throughout the uh, county of Sonoma and the town of Windsor seemed to be the best candidate. And Windsor is a population of about 27,000 and there's about eight to 9,000 meters within Windsor. And they really wanted to, um, they have a, their climate action planning goals and they have their, some con water conservation goals and they were really looking for a program that could help them achieve both of those. So the pays what seemed like a viable candidate for them. Um, so they, their program launched in August of 2012 and that um, they were able to, they had uh, existing rebates that they were giving to customers for toilets and washers and they were able to um, instead use this pays model and use that money that they were previously using for those rebates to then um, help offset the cost of landscaping in the pays model for their customers. Next slide. So our results right now in Windsor, since 2012, oh, and the pilot that, we're, that we started in 2012, we started with RF funds under a Better Buildings pilot program. Um, so, so far we have about 5% of all residential units, 
an average of about 10% energy savings, 20% of indoor water use, and about $15 per month in net utility costs, average single family um, savings. And we've also reached over 50% of our multifamily properties, which we thought was a pretty significant number. It is a small town, so there aren't a lot of multifamily properties, but 50% was a pretty good. So we learned from Windsor that um, multifamily might be a viable, t viable option for this. Next slide. You want to go into a case study? Sure. And uh, the previous slide Misty was showing, I think, is you know that's what we were using for our engineering estimates to make sure that yes, when we can make an offer, the idea that someone's going to save more than they're paying, those thresholds about kind of 20% indoor use was what is our engineering estimates. Then you get to the real world. Uh, and we're happy to see that it was at least a little bit better than we thought it was going to be. It's much better than worse. Uh, and two different scenarios just to kind of highlight that. Um, one was just a simple two-person single-family home. Uh, you know, based upon their reported usage, they qualified for their program. But when they were installing high-efficiency toilets, replacing some what were 1.6s, but are actually flushing at 2.7 gallons per flush, um, replacing shower heads that were rated at 2.5 or at actually 2.7, we replaced them with 1.5 gallon per minute shower heads, aerators. I mean, a typical water conservation package. Uh, they started saving 55% of their monthly water use. Uh, so certainly, I mean, this is just a family of two. They, they didn't have teenagers or anybody like that showering at home. Uh, alternatively, on the multifamily side, similar package in terms of those efficiencies. Uh, this was a, um, uh, I believe it was a, a low-income housing uh, mm -hmm. property. And so uh, this was a place where everything was master metered and everything was billed to the property owner. Uh, and so for them, it was a really good kind of proposition uh, where they're seeing 35% savings on their water usage, um, keeping in mind this also is just the water. Um, Windsor's water rates are very high, um, but you're also looking at savings coming from natural gas usage for water heating, uh, which is also a, a nice plus to be saving that as a you know, local GHG production or reduction uh, as well. Um, so Misty, back to you. All right, next slide. Um, so you could go to the other slide too. Um, so with the success for Windsor, um, we have the Bay Area Regional Energy Network, which is a Bay Area um, our energy network. And we were able to expand our PAYS program. Um, so we were able to expand it for Windsor to also include commercial landscaping. And the city of Hayward was interested in expanding it to multifamily residential. And then we also have been in discussions with East Bay Mud and San Francisco uh, Public Utilities Commission. Um, but we're still kind of at the, the test project approval stages and concept page, paper stages for those two. But Green Hayward Pays is actually moving forward. So we'll tell you a little bit about what's going on there. And um, this is, we're really excited about this. We're getting the loan documents signed for this to fund the uh, program up front, uh, which is hopefully going to happen anytime because we're at the same time out there kind of generating interest. Mm -hmm. Our target is 2,000 units. Uh, and there are already about 2,000 plus units that are interested in the program. So we're very excited about that. Uh, it was a, it's, was, it's definitely a process that's built upon the successes of Windsor. So Windsor was the first program of its kind in California. We've since kind of leveraged the tools, the templates for that uh, to really help speed the process in uh, Hayward. And we're looking to hopefully have that translate to even faster ramp up and deployment in other utilities that are interested in this. Um, but I think that we're excited to kind of see, next slide, uh, some of the potential water savings, certainly, which would be on a similar scale to, I think, what we have, see, have seen in Windsor. Um, it's also nice to know that from a cost perspective, it's also still appealing. Hayward's rates are about half of what Windsor's water rates are. So while the dollar savings are still not as, I mean, Windsor is, it's a slam dunk. San Francisco, it's a slam dunk in terms of an economic argument. But even in a place where the water rates are more typical of what you might see in other communities like where we all are from, there's still a net bottom po line positive to property owner. Uh, they don't have any money out of pocket. They get all these items up, uh, improved in their property. 
particularly for multifamily where you have some of these new regulations about making sure that all toilets are 1.28s or better. Um, rather than that stick of code, this is a carrot to kind of appeal to that, uh, that need. So I think with that, um, is there anything you want to conclude with? That it. That concludes our presentation. We're happy to answer questions at the time. Um, um, excellent, and um, just really uh, impressed with how different everybody's um, approaches to um, to water energy are. Just completely different approaches, and very impressive and innovative thinking here. So, um, this is a very very high powered. Uh, uh, group of uh, folks who are on, on the cutting edge of, um, of, of this field, I think. So we've got about 20 minutes to take advantage of, uh, of their, their wisdom and um, to see who has questions. Hi, uh, Jeff Alexander with San Diego Gas and Electric. I'm the water energy nexus point of contact for the utility. Um, I had a question for the last presenters. Uh, you were looking at bill neutrality on the wall, water bills once you put the uh, equipment in place. How long does it take? What's the average length of uh, loan repayment for that? When we're looking at our typical indoor packages, we're trying to hit a 10-year or better threshold, certainly. Uh, we're looking at including, uh, depending upon the utility, the, hot, the, the water savings, potentially sewer savings if it's volumetric sewer, uh, natural gas from water heating as well as potentially electricity since we have some indoor fi items like LED lighting fixtures and things like that which Hayward's pursuing um, but it is that kind of 10-year term there are a couple safeguards in there too where we're looking at kind of an 80 percent rule for multifamily and commercial or a 75 percent rule as Misty was saying to help insulate the customer against behavior and other variables to help ensure that they are seeing savings. So some of those components of that idea of the offer, you know, the fact that they are going to be insulated a little bit, they are going to see some, some return, some net savings in beyond just their, their surcharge um, is what helps st or stretches that payment term to that 10 year threshold for some items. Um, in Windsor, they're actually looking at for outdoor landscaping a 15 year term. But that's also because they're committed to making sure that that surcharge for landscaping is only applied during the months when people are irrigating. So you're really only putting the surcharge on for six months out of the year. Um, a lot of, in the multifamily segment, uh, it's 55% in this county and growing. And a lot of those, uh, a lot of those units are not sub-metered. So I, I see you talked about a low income master metered thing. How would you handle doing that with uh, like condominiums and that type sure. of um, project? Well, I think a condominium with an HOA is, is a kind of a cloudy kind of, there's, there's some things that we're not getting into with that, but we're, we are looking at kind of a strict multifamily relationship where there might be um, you know, a master meter, but something, a bill might get billed back through their, you know, ratio utility billing systems where people might get a bill for based upon the square footage of their unit or something like that um, so there's definitely some you know issues related to that that are I know are coming through the legislature what we're trying to do is at least itemize on the bill those charges which would theoretically be billed back on that ratio utility billing to the the property owner versus or to the to the tenant versus those costs which would or those savings which we as we understand based upon the property owners reporting don't get billed back so for instance electricity isn't something that a property owner is allowed to bill back to their tenants because electricity is um, sub metered but natural gas or water sometimes is sometimes is not so based upon the reporting of the property owner that's how we're itemizing some of those surcharges thank you Greg Galvin, City of Santa Cruz, a question for the San Diego Water Authority. Uh, I was wondering what process you went through to determine that desal was the best opportunity, uh, given that it's a huge energy footprint and a huge uh, water consumption footprint, uh, and it takes water from the ocean that a wastewater plant puts water into. Um, it was about a 12-year process. Um, so for San Diego County, um, 
when we weigh in reliability um, into it's different than when other agencies might do a cost-benefit analysis. So for us, um, being at the end of the pipeline, reliability plays a lot bigger role than maybe some other agencies. And so, um, uh, you know, it was a, a long process, um, environmentally sensitive, um, and we went through all of the all of the channels, all of the lawsuits, um, and so when we write, when we weigh in trying to get off the imported supply, desal just starts to bubble to the top and make more and more sense for our regional supply of water. And so, um, you know, there's a you can give a hour presentation on just the desal plant, and that's something that the water authority offers. So. Um, in the short term, um, we have a lot of detailed information about the desal plant, how we got to where we're at now, and what it's going to look like moving forward. And so I encourage you to go to our website and just go right to our fact sheet that's got all the information about the, the desal plant on there. Um, two questions, actually. So first is, what's the status and results of the pilot? Are you going to be rolling that? Is that going to be rolled out to uh, the PACE program to other cities? And the second question is, um, in San Francisco, there are a ton of restaurants that are really water intensive. And are there any programs or pilots that you foresee serving restaurants? Um, do you wanna... uh, so your first question is about pilots. Because uh, it was a pilot program, right? Mm -hmm. For oh. OK, and so the result is that done. And is it going to be rolled out? If it's successful, is it going to be rolled out in other cities? Yeah, so through the Bay Area Regional Energy Network, we're looking at other, other possible other cities' future funding to have to bring it to other cities in the future. So if there's anybody that's interested in, you know, having conversations about the possibility in your city or some neighboring cities that would be interested, you can talk to us about that. But right now, um, that's one source of funding. We also could be looking at other sources. Um, Right now we've got Windsor and Hayward that are on board. I mean, we say pilots, but they'll probably be going on for a while. Um, Windsor is still currently um, going on, so they didn't, we didn't just stop that program there. And um, looking to expand it, as I said, into like the East Bay Mud Territory and possibly into San Francisco. Those are two um, avenues we're also exploring and talking with people there. So, and part two, your question: Are there going to be any programs for restaurants? Well, we're fortunate to be working with the East Bay Municipal Utility District. Um, Richard Harris is there, cons works in their conservation program there, and he is um, very focused on finding ways to kind of serve food service. Um, and uh, he's, I mean, there's certain complexities there where you're looking at different ownership um, or kind of tenant uh, longevity, kind of how long they are in these places, how they typically procure their equipment in terms of leasing and things like that. Um, so there's, you know, we think we've got certain components dialed in a little bit more, like multifamily. And for something like that, if a new community is interested, we're definitely working on ways to kind of you know, take advantage of, at this point, it's $1.2 million in DOE or California ratepayer funds that have kind of facilitated the program designs to this point, kind of the, the R&D money. Um, so for multifamily, that's definitely something that we think can be very quickly rolled out at much lower cost to new communities uh, versus food service technology and figuring out, you know, scenarios around leasing equipment and things like that on an on-bill mechanism. Um, that's why we're excited to be using some of this, this fortunate CPUC funding and ratepayer funding to explore that in East Bay Mud. And that's going to definitely also leverage, you know, the existing pg e programs and things like that as well. So. Rick Phelps, Eastern Sierra Energy Initiative, a partnership uh, based in Mammoth Lakes. Um, Please forgive me, I had to step out and I don't think I didn't hear you address it, but since uh, irrigation, uh, residential irrigation is more than, I can't remember the number, more than 50% of aggregate water use, what, uh, what are the programs that you anticipate having in that area through your PAYS program? Well, um, so the, the town of Windsor is doing a, a single family residential kind of lawn conversion to drought tolerant landscaping. Uh, so that is something that works very well in Windsor based upon their water rates, um, but it's also also a 15 year term. So there are some components of that which we want to tighten up a little bit. Um, 
the city of Hayward and East Bay Mud are looking at um, irrigation kind of retrofit uh, and upgrades, uh, basically looking to reduce and repair leaks uh, and also install weather-based irrigation controllers. And Sonoma's, uh, sorry, Windsor's actually going to be looking at something similar in the Sonoma Airport uh, Business Center area as well for commercial properties up there. Um, so it's something that uh, there is a lot of, uh, one, I mean, it's the variability of the weather. There's the a very big behavior component on that in terms of scheduling of irrigation systems and making sure that that is maintained once it's optimized. Um, but those are some of the things that we're dialing in right now with these current pilots. And I'd add that, you know, for, con for customers, the landscape component is a big sell for this program, you know, to be able to change, to have some money or be able to fund some, some of the landscape upgrades and, and change out your lawn. So that's been really nice, at least for the town of Windsor. Just from a standpoint of technology, I, I was involved in installing a, a retrofit of a large Air Force base, a million dollar project, uh, with a, tied to the weather and evapotranspiration. But that same technology you can buy today for $500 for, for home use. So it's, and it can be programmed in, and in particularly in an area where you have network access, you can do all sorts of neat stuff. Oh, Corey Downs with the City of Chula Vista. Um, for the PAYS program, it sounded like most of the participants were uh, municipal water districts where they, they controlled the water. Is that the case? It's or the program certainly needs to be hosted by a water retailer who is billing its customers because you're, I mean, you need that, the bill mechanism. So, so that doesn't need to be a specific a jurisdiction that is a water provider? Correct. Correct. Okay. So, I mean, and so I know. Um, we were fortunate to come down here and do it, did a presentation in October um, with the authority, uh, and um, but it was to the, the the agencies, the member agencies, who are the ultimate builder. Um, well, then, can I ask a, a follow up, maybe to Lori from the San Diego uh, Water Authority? Do you know if any of the Jersey water districts or your members are interested in um, doing any programs like that? You know, they were provided the information, but as far as I know, none of them have moved forward with participating in that program. Um, not to say that they don't already provide a multitude of programs, incentives, and resources to their customers directly. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Morace with Southern California Gas Company. I had a quick question. Uh, for the last two speakers regarding the uh, type of retrofits that are done through your program because I, I heard you mention um, I think gas water heaters and so I was just curious if it involves um, water heating equipment or just the aerators and sh not just but you know aerators and uh, shower heads the um I, I was speaking I think to the to just the benefit of natural gas savings from hot water reductions, but I, and within the single family realm, we haven't found kind of a cost effective water heater retrofit yet, um, but within multifamily in Hayward, we're certainly looking at um, central boilers and hot water distribution systems, um, recirculation pumps, um, pipe insulation and things like that to uh, kind of increase the efficiency of, of those larger systems. Uh, and we certainly, s Based upon our engineering estimates, at least, it, it should be penciling, and that's where we're trying to really dial things in as we actually do now site visits in the city of Hayward and looking at those actual systems. So. This question is for Lori. Um, you mentioned that there was funding for the leak loss prevention program, and none of the um, agencies wanted to participate. And can you talk more about the challenge um, of convincing them. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's strictly a resource issue. So, you know, they're focused on delivering water and they're focused on um, their own uh, leak loss detection program. And it does require quite a bit of staff time to provide the data and the analysis and the time to send somebody out for somebody else to look at your infrastructure. Um, and so really the, the first and foremost reason was we don't have time for 
to participate in the program. And so what we're hoping to learn now that we have a participant is that, you know, it's like having your neighbor. And so we're hoping that the results from this, the other water agencies will see that it's going to be worth it for them to be able to provide that resource to be able to participate in future programs. And also, I have to say that some agencies, you know, they maybe don't want everybody to know what their leak loss detection program is or isn't. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not robust enough or maybe they, they don't really want somebody else coming in and they're playing their cards a little closer to their chest and, you know, they're not ready to just put that out there for everybody else to see. And so we understand that and we're sensitive to that. But we, at the same time, you know, we have this great program and now we have a great participant. So we're moving forward and just taking the, the good, the bad, and the ugly along with us to refine for better programs in the future. Um, since you guys are moving forward with it, are you tracking water savings and the energy savings from the pilot? And then maybe if you can speak to the thoughts about expansion, if they are in 2015 to other cities. Yeah, yeah, it's, we're tracking both sides of it. Um, and from this, we're hoping from the pilot program, um, the idea behind it is the final report will give you, um, you know, what the real cost is for you know, letting a leak go longer than you have to or not knowing that there's a leak there. Um, but it'll, it'll address both sides of it. And, and the idea behind the pilot is to set benchmarks um, for criteria that, that would be beneficial to cities. And I think that's a big piece of the cell. If you can go in with the approach that, um, you know, if you go through this process, you know, here's the potential savings based on what we find. Um, you know, and then just the education of it, because I think you've heard it mentioned, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a big task. And when you bring it to uh, water agencies, uh, you know, end user, if you will, like I am, uh, you, have to, you have to sell it the right way, because it, it is a, it's, a, it's a big undertaking. But if you break it down um, and you can realize the benefits of it, um, you, you'll get people on board. So that's the idea behind it. And, it's, and I think it's a great program. It really, it really is showing a lot. So, sorry, just at how many cities are participating? I'm sorry. How many cities are participating? The pilot program, I believe it's five. There's five cities okay. involved, and that's again just to set up benchmarks for you know who should be in this program, who should we offer it to, type of thing. So. Yeah, just a quick comment. In order to uh, use ratepayer funding from the CPUC, we have to use we have to try to determine what the energy savings are. So for this leak loss detection program, we are also looking at that. We're trying to extrapolate that information, uh, but we're also doing a project uh, with County Water Authority with one of their member agencies and doing just a leak loss detection program with UC Davis, and. Um, because it's a very convoluted, very complex situation, obviously in Southern California where we import a lot of water. Uh, there's a lot more pumping, a lot more energy intensity down here. So uh, we're working with UC Davis to see what our region alone has for intensity. And hopefully it'll match what Navigant says. <laughs> well, I just want to end with, with one, just one sort of broad question. If, if we could change one thing about, or, or add to, um, the the state the state sponsored utility programs and just sort of go down the line, just one thing. Um, what would it be if you can do that in a few seconds or less? <laughs> the, the the top one. You which know, one's going to save the most? The funding cycle thing. It's that you know you just get started and it takes a while to get. Um, um, you know, MOUs and agreements in places, even with our own member agencies. And mm -hmm. we have to have a separate agreement with SDG&E for this money to, you know, come down the loop. And it takes time to get those in place and scope and the consultants and budget and schedules. And by the time you really get going, the funding cycle's over. So you're talking about the two-year so cycle wanna, and, We want to yeah. see longer funding cycles so we can, um, you know, have time to get our work done. Okay, thanks. Scott? Yes, absolutely. It's it's um, uh, it's a daunting task. Um, I think as we refine it, it it'll go better. But um, the red tape, 
um, just everything involved with trying to pull it together mm -hmm. um, is really challenging. And, and I think we're in a learning stage now, so I think it'll get better, but that is by far the biggest hiccup. Right. Um, I would say more innovative programs like PAYS. That, you know, with the Bay Run, we were able to kind of expand the PAYS pilot to other cities, and it's been great, so mm -hmm. being open to that. Great. Only because I'm dealing with a lot of water utilities, and this isn't the the, the, the state IOUs, but um, water utility billing systems are so all over the map, <laughs> and they measure them in CCF and 1,000 gallon increments and single gallons, and they read monthly or bi-monthly, and they have it's daunting to you know to 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 try to think about that from the statewide perspective, and right. you know, but I think that. Um, there's a lot to be gained um, from for customers as well as for um, the utilities themselves if, if there was some magic pot out there for them to update those systems. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm new to all this, so I, and I would ask that to sort of learn some, some of the top things that, you know, were maybe obvious to you but not to me, so I appreciate that. Um, anyway, thank you so much and um, for the, the, the presentations. Thank you all for being here and uh, being at this conference. And um, I think there's a reception now for those who want to stick around. And um, talk to you all later. Thank you.